Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look... The listening part of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part, you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extracts once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions from 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Alejandro. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mr. Alejandro. Can you tell me about your problem? Doctor, over the past week, I've been getting an increased shortness of breath. I have also developed some abdominal pain. However, I was continuing my regular activities until the other day when I passed out at home. My wife called paramedics and I was brought to the emergency ward. Oh, I see. Hmm. What's your age? 35, doctor. Your diagnosis report shows bilateral pulmonary infarcts and increasing BUN and creatinine. What medication you are taking? Heparin. Do you have any past history of any renal problems? No, doctor. I was feeling completely normal until recently. What about your appetite? It's good. Any swelling in your feet or ankles? No, doctor. Do you have chest pain? No, doctor. And your bowl and bladder habits? Normal. Any sudden weight loss? No, doctor. Your blood pressure level is 130 on 170. There is no organomegaly and no peripheral edema. Your laboratory reports show hemoglobin count 14.8, white count 16.3, sodium level 133. Potassium 5.1, chloride 104, and CO2 of 19. BUN test shows 26 and creatinine level is 3.5, and earlier it was 0 0.9. The CAT scan report of your abdomen shows poor perfusion to your right kidney. I think you have acute renal failure, probably vein thrombosis. Hypercoagulable state is indicated. Deep venous thrombosis with pulmonary embolism. Probably you have developed azotemia due to elevation of blood urea nitrogen, BUN, and serum creatinine levels. Your exposure to intravenous contrast materials may be the primary cause of your condition. 
I am going to prescribe you rivaroxaban 20 mg per day for anticoagulation. Hopefully with this anticoagulation, there will be some relief for your renal vein thrombosis. Or else, if your renal failure becomes progressive, I would advise dialytic intervention. I advise you to undergo a triple renal scintigraphy to investigate the three phases of your renal functioning system. In this diagnosis, a small amount of radioactive substance will be injected into your vein that is taken by the kidneys. This diagnosis involves the use of radioactive substance to investigate your kidneys and assess their function. Thank you, doctor. Extract 2. Questions from 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. Zachary. For questions from 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mr. Zachary. May I know what your problem is? I'm a patient of a gross inventoria, doctor, and I was admitted to the emergency ward of my hometown for evaluation of my disease. When did this occur? Two months back, doctor. There. My CT scan showed no hydronephrosis or upper tract process, but there was a thickening of the left and posterior bladder wall, so they referred to urology. Okay. What's your age? 65. Brief me about your past medical history. A gunshot wound in 2000, followed by exploratory laparotomy twice. What medications are you taking now? Metaprol 100 mg, Diltiazem 120 mg daily, Hydrocodone 10 out of 500 mg, Pravastatin 40 mg daily, Lisinopril 20 mg daily, Hydrochlorothiazide, 25 mg daily. Are you allergic to any medication? No, doctor. So, I advise you to go for a bladder biopsy and a workup for a right adrenal lesion to analyze serum, cortisol, potassium, and aldosterone in ACTH level measurement. Get this completed and meet me again with the diagnosis reports. Okay, doctor. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Hello, Mr. Zachary. How are you? Have you got the diagnosis reports? I'm okay, doctor. Here are all the diagnosis reports. Hmm. The bladder biopsy confirms high-grade muscle-invasive transitional cell carcinoma with muscularis purpurea in the specimen. But the other workup seems to be totally negative. I am really sorry to inform you that the transitional cell carcinomas are really very difficult to treat. Muscle invasive carcinoma is likely to spread to other parts of the body, and I have to get it treated either by removing the tumor or by treating the bladder with chemotherapy. I would suggest surgical resection of the tumor. However, the chance of reoccurrence is very common. You should undergo radical curative surgery in the form of a cystoprostatectomy with lymph node sampling. I would advise metomycin into your bladder along chemotherapy as 6 dose regimen after resection of the tumor. What is the chance for survival, doctor? Actually, I will have to treat this muscle invasive carcinoma more aggressively. Well, with your cooperation, I hope everything will go well. Sure, doctor. I will extend my full cooperation. I have full trust in your experience.
Listening Part B. You hear a junior doctor speaking with a patient in the cardiac clinic while a consultant is present. Now, read the question. Hello again, Mr. Waits. We met last week, didn't we? I've been telling my colleague here about you. I've seen the results of the tests, but there are just one or two points I'd like you to clarify for me and for the benefit of Dr. Granger. You did say that this pain and discomfort has troubled you for nearly eight months and is getting worse? That's right, Doctor. Can I get you to describe the character of the pain? Or in other words, tell us what it is like exactly. It's not always a pain as such. Often it's a feeling of discomfort in my chest, like someone's pressing down on it. What about your breathing when you get the pain? I don't notice any difference. Now, what would happen if you and I and Dr Granger here went for a walk up the hill to the station? What's that now? I just mean, if we were to walk, what do you think would happen? Do you think you could keep up with me if I walked fast? Oh, yes. Well, last summer, I climbed up Ben Nevis in Scotland, so I've no problems there. Listening Part B. You hear a senior nurse talking about removing sutures to a group of students. Now, read the question. When removing sutures, firstly put on your apron. If you have long hair, be sure that it is tied back securely. Explain to the patient that you're going to remove their sutures. They'll probably use the word stitches. Secondly, ask them if they're comfortable. They may ask if the procedure will hurt. Reassure the patient that removing sutures doesn't hurt. Third, perform hand hygiene. That means washing your hands thoroughly and drying with a paper towel. Then prepare your equipment, including some gauze, cleansing solution and stitch cutter on a sterile tray. Put your hand inside a sterile waste bag and use it like a glove to remove the bandage from the sutures. Turn the sterile bag inside out so that the bandage is now inside the bag. Put on your sterile gloves. Finally, look at each suture and check that inflammation has not occurred. Listening Part B. You hear a staff nurse talking to a patient she is escorting to the radiology department. Now, read the question. Hi, Jake. It's time for your x ray now. Are you ready? Oh, okay. Can you walk to the radiology department, do you think? Is there a wheelchair or a walking stick, maybe? I'm a bit weak this morning. There's a wheelchair. Oh, that'd be great, thanks. Of course. Let me help you. There you are. Are you warm enough? I'm a bit cold, actually. Let me get you a blanket. There. Is that better? Thanks. And I just need to see your identity bracelet, please. Thanks. What's your full name? Jake Peterson. Your date of birth? 18th of January, 1982. Okay, thanks. Listening part B. You hear a nurse talking to a patient in the recovery unit. Now, read the question. Mrs. Wendell, can you hear me? Yes. 
I'm your recovery room nurse. Your heart bypass surgery went very well. Oh, good. I'm going to be taking your vital signs every 15 minutes and be checking your oxygen levels. The mask you're wearing will help with that. Can you breathe all right? Yes, but my chest hurts. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being no pain at all and 10 being the worst pain, what number do you think your pain is right now? Oh, I guess about 4 or 5. Okay. And do you feel nauseous? No, but I feel cold. Listening part B. You hear the beginning of a training session for doctors. Now read the question. The function of the endocrine system is to regulate the various organs within the body and it does this by using hormones, which are produced by glands. Today we are going to look at ways in which the endocrine system can malfunction and the effects that that can produce. I would like to begin by looking at the functioning of the thyroid gland. This is one of the largest glands in the body and it is located in the neck below the mouth. It produces a number of hormones, the most important of which are T3 and T4. Listening part B. You hear a doctor talking to a nurse about a patient called Mr. Kransky. Now read the question. Can you tell me how Mr. Kransky's doing? Mr. Kransky? Mm, he's doing quite well, but he still has difficulty swallowing. Has he seen the speech and language therapist yet? Yes, he sees her every day to do tongue exercises to help his swallow reflex. That's good. What type of diet is he on now? He started on a puree diet yesterday. How's he managing with it? He's managing it quite well. What about the fluids? He's still having thickened fluids and he's coping quite well with them. Okay. Mm. Can he feed himself yet? No, not yet. He still needs help. Okay. I'll write up a referral to the OT. Thanks. Maybe she can bring a few things to help him feed himself. Right. Can you keep him on the puree diet and thicken fluids until his swallow reflex is better? Sure. I'll review him at the end of the week. Has he seen the speech and language... You hear an interview with a radiation therapist called Roger Atkins, who treats patients with cancer.
We are talking today with radiation therapist Roger Atkins, Programme Director of Radiation Therapy at Hull University. So, Mr Atkins, why do we need radiation therapists? Cancer encompasses over 125 diseases. In the UK alone, over 1 million people will be diagnosed with cancer this year. Approximately 70% of cancer patients will receive radiation therapy. The goal of radiation therapy is to eradicate cancer cells, while at the same time sparing normal cells. Because radiation therapy is such an important part of treating cancer, there is a growing need for competent, caring radiation therapists in all parts of the world. As a medical radiation professional, it can be confronting to experience loved ones going through cancer and radiation therapy. But it is also very important the way that we communicate and deliver education to patients throughout their cancer journey. What inspired you to become a radiation therapist? My career as a radiation therapist is directly linked to my own mother dying of ovarian cancer during my junior years of college. She was diagnosed with cancer when I was a college student. As I accompanied her during cancer treatments over the next two years, I learned about the various people who worked with cancer patients. I remember the radiation therapist who treated my mum. He was a very compassionate man, a good communicator. He was always happy to listen to her, to her concerns and anxieties. Listening to him, the way he worked with my mum, it had a lasting impact on me. Although I was originally a history major, I came to the realisation that my life's work would be working with and caring for cancer patients. From this personal experience, I chose a career in radiation therapy. What does a radiation therapist do? A radiation therapist is a valuable member of a cancer treatment team who delivers radiation treatments to patients, helps construct treatment plans and works with cancer patients and their families. Cognitive psychomotor and effective thinking skills are used every day. When a patient is treated with radiation therapy, they can only receive a limited amount of radiation dose each day. Consequently, it takes anywhere from two to eight weeks for a patient to complete their treatment regime. Because they usually see the one patient five days per week for so many weeks, radiation therapists often develop close relationships with their patients. The radiation therapist also needs to be able to plan, evaluate and assess several parameters for each patient every day. The radiation therapist will also assess the patient's reaction to treatment, providing advice on the side effects of treatment and methods of alleviating these. Can you describe an individual case to us? Well, I recently treated a patient called Susan. Now, Susan was quite comfortable in the radiation therapy setting because she herself had previously worked in a radiology practice. She even went as far as to tell me that she felt cared for in that environment. Her husband, however, had a different reaction to Susan's radiation therapy altogether. He found the linear accelerator confronting. He had trouble reconciling radiation dose as a cancer-killing mechanism. After all, doesn't radiation also kill you? and thought the advances of science would mean that Susan would not be treated on an imposing machine in a concrete bunker. What would you say is the most rewarding aspect of your career? First, seeing and speaking with patients who I treated 10 to 15 years ago and having them give me a hug is very rewarding. Second, as a radiation therapy teacher, I see the accomplishments of our program's alumni and the many lives they have touched, cared for and helped cure. We are very proud of each graduate. Their work is noble and greatly benefits humanity. When I teach, I don't only talk about radiation therapy, but I also discuss how the use of radiation can benefit mankind and improve the quality of our lives through both medical imaging and radiation therapy. And finally, how do you see the future for radiation therapy and cancer treatment? Well, I think quite a lot about the importance of research focusing on patients' perspectives and improving the way that we communicate and deliver education to patients throughout their cancer journey. It may well be that patients are nervous or anxious when they present to radiation therapy because they have had a difficult experience in another health setting or perhaps have already experienced chemotherapy side effects. Then there's the issue of patients who have a family and young children. Patients in this situation face a quandary in deciding what to tell their children, and each patient manages this experience differently. 
Many parents want to protect their children from distress and so do not communicate with the children about their illness or they give them limited information. However, clear and open communication in an age-appropriate way emerges strongly across a number of studies and quality communication between parents and children is associated with emotional health when a parent has cancer. Listing Part C. You hear a dermatologist called Dr. Ann Werner giving a presentation on the subject of vitamin D production. Hello, my name is Dr. Anne Werner. I'm a dermatologist and author. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about vitamin D production. We all need vitamin D. It spurs bone growth, and without it, we'd be at high risk of conditions such as muscle aches, muscle weakness, bone pain, osteoporosis, and fractures. One way we produce vitamin D is through our skin, which our skin manufactures when it is exposed to sunlight. The sun's ultraviolet B rays interact with a protein called 7-DHC in the skin, converting it into vitamin D3, the active form of vitamin D. The problem is that currently, too many people think that using sunscreen and other forms of sun protection lead to vitamin D deficiency, and that the best way to obtain enough of the vitamin is through unprotected sun exposure. But that can lead to a whole other set of serious problems. Vitamin D helps keep your bones strong by regulating calcium levels. In recent years, some proponents of vitamin D have hypothesized that it does everything from decreasing cancer deaths and heart disease to inhibiting type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. However, these suggestions are based on observational studies alone. This means that the researchers have observed that people with enough vitamin D have a lower incidence of deaths from these diseases but not that vitamin D is the reason they are lower. While observational studies may be a good starting point, they are not proof or basis for medical recommendations. In contrast, there is an overwhelming evidence for the multiple benefits of sun protection. Controlled studies have shown that regular use of an SPF 15 or higher broad spectrum sunscreen reduces your chances of developing squamous cell carcinoma by about 
40%, melanoma by 50%, and premature skin aging by 24%. It has been proven on the molecular level that the sun's ultraviolet UV light damages the skin's cellular DNA, creating genetic mutations that can lead to skin cancer. In addition, UV radiation harms the eyes and can cause cataracts, eyelid cancers, and other ocular skin cancers. In short, unprotected sun exposure puts you at risk for any number of conditions that can permanently damage your skin, disfigure you, and sometimes even kill you. And the regular use of sun protection can go a long way to keep any of that from happening. High SPF sunscreens are designed to filter out most of the sun's UVB radiation, since UVB damage is the major cause of sunburn and can lead to skin cancers. UVB wavelengths also happen to be the specific wavelengths that trigger vitamin D production in the skin. Nonetheless, clinical studies have never found that everyday sunscreen use leads to vitamin D insufficiency. In fact, the prevailing studies show that people who use sunscreen daily can maintain their vitamin D levels. One of the explanations for this may be that no matter how much sunscreen you use or, or how high the SPF, some of the sun's UV rays still reach your skin. An SPF 15 sunscreen filters out 93% of UVB rays. SPF 30 keeps out around 97%, and SPF 50 filters out 98%. This leaves anywhere from 2 to 7% of solar UVB reaching your skin, even with high SPF sunscreens. And that's if you use them perfectly, of course. Even committed proponents of unprotected sun exposure recommend no more than 10 to 15 minutes of exposure to arms, legs, abdomen, and back two to three times a week, followed by good sun protection. That minor amount of exposure produces all the vitamin D your body can muster. After that, your body automatically starts to dispose of vitamin D to avoid an overload of the vitamin, at which point your sun exposure is giving you nothing but sun damage without any of the presumed benefit. The thing is, even just those unprotected 10 or 15 minutes are way more than enough time to cause DNA damage and every bit of this damage adds up throughout your lifetime, producing more and more genetic mutations that keep increasing your lifetime risk of skin cancer. The question is then, if not from UV exposure, where should you obtain most of your vitamin D? Fatty fish such as salmon, mackerel, and tuna are especially good sources. Small amounts are also present in egg yolks, beef liver, and cheese. And many common foods such as milk and orange juice are fortified with vitamin D. It is possible then, though sometimes difficult, to mix and match these foods to get the daily allowance of 600 international units recommended for the average person between the ages of one and 70. However, if food sources aren't enough, you may need to add in a supplement. Remember though, that most nutritionists believe food should always be your first choice with supplements used as reinforcements. The bottom line is food, supplements, and incidental protected sun exposure will give you all the vitamin D you need.